Uh, I'd like to keep this reasonably informal. Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be a deep technical lecture, but I hope I can stimulate some people to actually think about a set of problems which I think are getting more and more critical. <coughs> Let me start a little bit with background. You know, we've, we've had a remarkable stint over the last, what, 20-some uh, odd years, 30 years, with the growth of the internet. As some of the younger ones may not completely realize, the internet was an experiment. It was an experiment in a new form of communications initially. Paul Barron proposed many years ago that packet switching, for a whole host of reasons, was a better way of doing things than the circuit switching uh, essentially the normal communication had. The, um, and basically, DARPA decided to perform an experiment in building an experimental packet network with uh, experimental machines connected to it. Notice it was an experiment. Uh, it was not a production operation. It was not intended to be a production operation. Uh, in spite of uh, revisionist history, it was not designed to survive in thermonuclear war. <laughs> uh, hopefully it survived the pile of young students who were working on it. Uh, it was a small group of people. It was a set of friends. So we all knew each other. You know, I, my students like Postel and Mark Petrus and others were deeply involved in trying to get this body thing running. In that environment, the last thing that people worried about were issues such as security and robust, well, robustness to a degree, but security. Because after all, we were friends. You know, who was going to do anything bad? And so as normal in systems with those aims, people started designing protocols and eventually software where security was not designed into it. And most of us, I think, fair to say almost all of us did not expect anything to particularly grow out of this system. In fact, the early ARPANET had severe limitations that basically precluded large-scale deployment of it. So a, an experiment was conducted. Uh, much to our astonishment, I think everybody's astonishment, suddenly it grew. It grew for a number of reasons, and you can Depending on whose history you like, you can uh, draw different reasons. The history I like, basically, is that about the time that the ARPANET and, and TCP was being, uh, which was a slight elaboration of the original uh, internet protocol, a device came along called a PC. And the PC was suddenly something that could deploy easily outside of computing centers and to homes. And uh, basically, a set of kids up in Boston uh, moved the, basically the protocols over to the PC and gave us the ability to do mail technology, remote access, a bunch of things. And they worked on desktops which suddenly made something that was of interest to other than computing centers to operate. And so it grew, and it grew fast. Uh, the, there were a lot of motivations to its growth. Do you mind if I sit, by the way? Otherwise, I'll wander around and, and give somebody a nervous breakdown trying to follow me. <coughs> the, uh, probably the, the key steps actually, and I'll repeat, I'll say this for historical purposes, uh, were that in about, uh, what, mid-80s, around that time, the deployment of, of technology around universities, et cetera, the, the Sputnik era, in a sense, created endless computer science departments all over the country, quite often with one systems person, one of these, one of those, you don't do research with one of. And so there was motivation on the part of a number of us, Wan Weber, myself, Peter Denning, a couple of us, uh, to deploy the technology that was at that point available only to a 
handful of universities and a handful of industrial people to allow computer science departments to talk to each other. And that was the CSNet activity. I won't go further into that, except um, it was a remarkable success, much to our astonishment how successful it was. Uh, within two years or so, we had essentially every computer science department in the country was connected together, at least by electronic mail, often by X25 connections, sometimes by internet connections. Okay? Uh, to top it all off, we did another thing, more accidental than anything else, uh, computer science graduates were in high demand in those days, and uh, every industrial lab was faced with a problem when students came up potentially for jobs. The, one of the questions that were asked is, do you have access to CSNet? And so what happened is we allowed industrial research labs to join in at outrageous uh, membership fees, which helped fund it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm terminating fast this historical discussion, but it is relevant. Uh, what, what, what then happened is that other departments at the university asked, can we join this thing? And computer science departments became computing centers, which was not a particular role in life. So the NSF uh, proceeded to fund the development of NSFNet the National Research and Education Network, uh, a set of regional networks which connected those together, and many of those commercialized, and away we went in a cloud of smog, uh, or smoke. Okay, why do I go through this history? Because the same basic philosophy, the same basic architecture of software was still being used protocols which were not particularly robust relative to security, in fact, maybe the opposite end, software systems that were, I think, to be mildly uh, were insecure, uh, operating quite often on hardware which was equally insecure. Okay. One of the lessons I think we've learned in the past, uh, time and time again, is that it's very hard to retroactively engineer security into those systems. You know, it, that's been true since day one in the, in the computer field. If you don't do it on, at the start, you ain't going to do it easily. And we've seen endless iterations of catastrophe after catastrophe. Any reason to believe it's possible at all? Uh, well, I'll argue that I believe it's possible. OK? okay? Patience. Okay. <laughs> You know, I, I, I always try to actually make it flow, but sometimes we get, feel free to derail me. I'm, I'm good at that. Um, the other problem, and this is a more recent problem, is that speeds increased in the, in the network. The ability to interconnect computers, other than maybe supercomputers, to the network has been limited by the architecture of the network, of the processors, the architecture of the software. So you have a combination of increased demands and uh, systems which are not particularly suited to sync those damp bandwidths. And that's going to become more common in the future. So we're, we're sort of, uh, I like to characterize it as we've built a system which is sitting on several pieces of ice, right? And no matter how you step on it, you get slid and things crash. And you see this constantly. And the question is, how long can we allow that to happen? Okay. Now, you could argue, well, <laughs> you know, just said that it's, it's a difficult problem. Uh, if you look back in history, though, I think you find a number of examples of systems which have made valiant attempts at solving some of these problems. Uh, you know, I could iterate some of them. Some of the inventors are in the room. Uh, there have been a number of capability-based architecture in the old days that actually gave rather decent protection within a mainframe, within a particular computer. Multex uh, certainly provided a remarkably secure environment within a given machine. Uh, there have been a couple of experiments, and if there's anybody here from Intel, allow me, excuse me for calling this an experiment. <laughs> uh, and things like the Intel 432, which 
You know, I always felt it was a noble experiment. Um, it taught us an awful lot. I had five of them. Um, other schools had five of them. Uh, just as a side thing, I was asked by the board of Intel to evaluate it as where, you know, how good was it for marketplace. And I said, you'll give away every, to every university in the country and probably sell none of them. Because it was an experiment. And uh, the experiment did provide a, an environment which had inherently a set of ideas that were quite, uh, quite good relative to the security model. Uh, I'm, good, uh, I'm going to go down the Intel path for a moment because it's the one I know best. But there are other examples of this. I'm not claiming they're the only ones. Uh, a later version, which sometimes we call Gemini, which was a rehash of the 432 architecture, which was basically a capability-based architecture, with more modern technology. And the 432 was programmed in ADA, if I remember correctly, which was, to put it mildly, amusing. Um, <laughs> I'm not an ADA uh, fiend, particularly. The Gemini machine was designed to do high availability, uh, sensitive applications in particular. It was a, a joint project between Siemens and Intel um, designed to create a telephone environment, which turned out Siemens didn't like, but others did. Um, I could tell a long story about why that did not become commercially feasible, but uh, let's do it outside the recordings. <laughs> yes, sir. Family, which actually did have huge success in the embedded world. And the commercial products of this fault tolerant system were introduced under the name BIND, B I I N. Yeah, I was about to uh, come. But Gemini, the original Gemini, was not very successful uh, for not technical reasons. Okay. Um, the next step where I'll, uh, was the uh, Palladium experiment, the Lagrange architecture which addressed several issues. One is the security model, which was rather successful. But the other one was to tighten the base architecture of the 432, I'm sorry, of the 386 family of processors, which was, was and still is rather leaky sieve. Uh, it did a very good job of tightening that. Uh, we won't get into why that didn't happen. Uh, trying to get Intel and Microsoft to work together was a, a noble experiment. I'll leave it at that. I, I still have the whips on the back of my thing and the saw seat from telecommuting, or not commu shuttle commuting between Portland and, and uh, Redmond. The, so we're faced, faced now with a whole bunch of experiments. I'd call them experiments. Uh, Intel now has the SGX and other things, which embeds some of these ideas in there. And there are other manufacturers. I'm just you know, I'm very familiar with Intel's thing. And so the question is, what happened? Why haven't we been able to do anything with that? The, I would argue that, the, that part of the problem is we succeeded. We succeeded dramatically in producing a a huge environment of people that are using the internet. And so basically the, uh, the problem is that almost anything you do faces the existing environment where we have what, hundreds of millions of computers, some of them still running Windows Zero, some of them running hardware that should never run, uh, connected up by God knows what. And to try to do anything other than patch and fill just perennially, perpetuates the problem. And you can see you know, how every day we get an announcement of another break and another problem. Now, some of those are social engineering, and some of them are just weaknesses in the system. Uh, we know that things like the DNS, uh, the main name system mechanisms, are very t uh, sensitive to attack. We know a lot of things are sensitive to attack. OK, so the, there have been a number of, of attempts to solve this problem by incrementalism. And I, my own feeling is that we've run out of steam. We have critical resources. 
that are currently serviced by s systems which are just intolerably sensitive to disruption. Now, I, uh, banks, uh, power systems, water problems, water systems are very sensitive because they're running old equipment. They're running uh, on protocols that are sensitive to disruption. And then to top it all off, the, app, the demands of the, of the system are getting higher. As we put more bits across the internet, there are whole sets of questions about whether or not the current packet switching architecture and TCP IP is the right vehicle to go forward with. And I think it's time to actually set back and say, OK, let's stop. Not stop fixing things, but now let's start looking at what we should build going forward in the future where we're going to potentially have terabits coming across the network, where we have basically a substantial distributed environment, be it cloud-based or whatever, uh, that requires a level of security we have not been able to achieve in the current internet. There are some examples of, of what I would call, um, and now I'll go back to some of my work if I'm allowed to. Uh, way back when in the 70s, there was an NSF funded activity called DCS, Distributed Computer System. And there the idea was to integrate the network and the processors, in a network and a set of processors into a fault tolerant secure environment. Um, it actually got built, and it did, in fact, do what we hoped it would do. Uh, it actually was fault tolerant. It was reasonably secure. And it was distributable. Uh, out of it came a number of ideas which uh, get rediscovered by the field about every five years. Uh, you know, uh, content addressing was there. Uh, there's just a number of... Um, of things, which is the reason I quoted Hamming at the beginning, that we keep forgetting the past. Now, if you ask the average student, uh, some of these old ideas that get replicated every five years, like capability systems, they'll say, oh, no, 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 no. And it's too, too noble an experiment. Uh, most of them, I don't think, know Moltex from a hole in a wall, right? And yet, these ideas, while not re directly re reproducible, are buildable upon. Um, now, you need a vehicle to do that. Uh, let me go back to another experiment, which uh, was successful in a very fundamental way. And in fact, I think is a good model for uh, how I would attack this problem. Uh, about what? 10 years ago now, uh, Bob Kahn and I proposed, well, I proposed and then wrote Bob into it, uh, the gigabit test bits. The problem was that we thought that the network was capable of sustaining speeds, even the, the TCP network, operating a gigabit, but nobody had ever tried it. And in fact, uh, not only nobody had ever tried it, but we proposed the experiment. We were told that why bother? Nobody will ever need a gigabit. <laughs> and I can show you the reviews that said that. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, uh, <coughs> the, the thing that made it very successful, and it was successful, Vince Cerf said that it took three years off the deployment time of gigabit technology in this country, which if you calculate how much it cost the government, was a rare bargain, almost as great a bargain as their investment in the internet. But what we did was to form an industrial academic cooperation. We used the industrial laboratories and their capabilities to build things that no university was capable of building. We wanted to build real gigabit test beds, not just a, a laboratory model. So it had to exist in the real world. So we needed the input from communication companies to give us the bandwidth, uh, computer companies to manufacture and duplicate and replicate the interfaces to computers, 
uh, and academics and industrial labs to think of the ideas. And you know, one model that, that I, one event that I think was very interesting, uh, one of my former students, I don't like the idea of former students. It's an interesting US thing. Most of the world, one, I'd say one of my students, but uh, Dave Zinkowski said he walked into his laboratory at Telcordia and he saw this pile of people he didn't recognize and some he did, and he couldn't tell which were his employees and which were our students because they worked together. Okay? And three independent activities yielded three different attacks on gigabit test beds. And there were three of them running around the country. Very successful, but not just an academic group going off and thinking, and not an industrial group trying to produce products. It was to produce an idea. It's time to do that. I think it's time to create, and it's a hard job. I don't think it's an easy job to sit down and understand how we can take these ideas in the from the past and new ideas and create an environment which is inherently secure. Uh, I'm going to be very careful there because uh, usually when you deal especially with process architecture, the comment you'll have is you're going to create a model, but that might be not the model you want in the future, so don't do it. Uh, that's a, that gets, doesn't get you far fairly fast, and you have to take a leap. And you have to create an environment which is, at least in current technology, as secure as you can be. And I think based on past research in a number of fields, we know fundamentally how to do that. And uh, I always felt, and I think I proved it once, that if we had actually had the Lagrange environment in place, I could build an end-to-end -end secure environment uh, against all but um, uh, black bag attacks, which are a little hard to actually pull off. The, so what do I propose? That we undertake what I think the NSF likes to call grand challenge and create a testbed environment where the role is to think up the next generation of environments in both the network, the processor, and the software environment and to produce protocols which I would call security protocols. Because what I'd like to do is be able to attach non-secure environments to my network and still protect the world against their bad, bad behavior, as well as processors, processors which I can guarantee as much as I know how to guarantee that they are not easily penetrated. I'm not going to say perfectly penetratable. So what do I do with it when I have it? Well, I proposed, and I proposed this actually to several groups in New York the other day, and nobody threw me out of the room, so I assume you might not, or maybe you will. I'm happy. Uh, I want to pick a model space to do it, do it for. And the space that I want to try is the financial industry. They have major, major nightmares. Uh, if you go talk to the head of almost any of the major banks, the real heads, they are, put it mildly, uh, disturbed, it's a polite way of putting it, over the lack of, of security in their environments and the potential downfall that could come with it. I would like to create a prototype system which not only gives you security but gives you the capability of handling the very high data rates that we're talking about in the future. I personally believe that it's a different type of architecture than, uh, than we currently use for the network. Uh, my own uh, approach, and I'm perfectly happy to argue this and probably will, uh, is a distributed memory environment where basically the, you're operating as a distributed environment where the network is just the back plane of a large virtual environment with the protection built in on that. Big one for the financial industry. Why do I pick them? They're a problem. And they have a marvelous regulatory mechanism called the Fed, which can, can under the right conditions, force technology to be used. What am I going to do about the existing internet? 
uh, prayer is appropriate. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, I should back. We're going to have to continue to patch. Okay. But I think we have to realize that we're patching and we're not going to achieve a real, uh, reliable environment, securable environment. Now, let me, let me try just for amusement, not for amusement. Um, every time I propose any secure environment, especially process environment, you run into an interesting problem, which I'll throw out. Uh, remember rights management? Okay. Uh, I, would, I, I would argue that any real secure machine which can isolate applications from each other in a guaranteed way, one of those applications can be rights management. And so if you have such a machine, it provides a home for rights management. That can be, and that was one of the arguments against um, machines like the Grove Grange approach, that it would provide the ability to do rights management. I think we have to decide right off the bat just how, is impo how important is rights management, how important is security. And you know, to take the deal of rights management, digital rights management stuff by law and by copyright law, not by saying that we can live in an environment which is as fragile as we have. Yes, sir. Dave, uh, what do you think security means? What does it mean for a system to be secure? And what rights are we talking about? Copyright or access rights or? No, I, I was talking, talking about copyright. The, the Hollywood rights management, not the uh, not the type of stuff that deals with who has access to what internally. That's a different issue. What I mean by secure is that I can run within a protected environment an application which can only reach the things that it has access rights to, and that that's guaranteed. There's no way of going under it, sideways, et cetera, and that those rights are maintained across network. Uh, if, again, I have a funny idea what a network looks like but across communication capabilities. So if, in fact, I have the right to do it here, I have the right to do it there if they're part of the same. Uh, and there's no way under it. So, for example, uh, data would be protected against uh, an examination by third parties? Yes. Uh, access to data would be protected. Uh, processes would be protected. Uh, there would be some mechanism for ensuring that a process is initiated only by a known party and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, stuff we know we've done in the past in pieces. And so, you know, uh, basically I propose to, to a number of people that it's time to actually go do that. Um, Before I go on, if I go on, uh, do I get any reaction? Um, <laughs> I'm happy to be thrown out, by the way. But. The question I would actually have of the historic part is, what were your impressions since I lived <laughs> some time as well, about the competitors to the TCP and NCP era? <coughs> back, back then, now a number of us who sit next to me here, we're you know, Hearing X25 is going to be the future, or if you were working for Big Blue or a Big Blue customer, SNA was going to be your future. Yeah. 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 Um, well, the actual the competition in this country was largely OSI, European versus uh, TCP. Uh, there was a National Research Council study of that, which I was on, several of us were on. And the problem fundamentally was that OSI was a, uh, a commi standards committee with all the problems that come from standards committee, while TCP IP was, was basically the, the uh, IETF with a demonstrated uh, <coughs> capability and a rough consensus. And so a lot more flexible than the TCP approach. And there were, there were some severe problems with OSI, as there were problems with TCP. But we felt that there was a lot more flexibility in TCP than there was in OSI. X25 
I mean, we, we use that in CSNet. It was perfectly reasonable. But uh, the, an SNA was proprietary protocol. It wanted to stay clear proprietary protocols. And it was a religious argument. You know, we did X, you did Y. But I think, on average, um, I think the decision to go with TCP was the correct decision at that time. And the ITF as a mechanism to establish quote standards is not a bad technique. Uh, was there anybody else? Yeah, I thought I did. Was secure, right? Huh? The other protocols weren't any more secure. They were no more secure than, than um, that. Uh, yes, sir? If you're rolling out a new protocol, uh, how do you prevent it from that's supposed to do everything everybody needs? How do you prevent it from exploding into the pile of bloatware that became <laughs> OSI and gossip in particular was the flavor of it that I um, <laughs> With care? No, I'm serious. I, I'm serious that a lot of it can be built not into software which floats around, but into uh, structures that are kept minimal. Again, you, if you believe my assumption that we're going to be moving around terabit pieces of information, there's remarkably little time to do anything. Now, one of the problems with TCP, and I could get thrown out for this one, is that if you're operating at, at terabits, TCP becomes a circuit switching network with some bad behavior. And so clearly, it's, it's time to, we, we may call it TCP, but it probably won't be because of the limitations of packet switching. And I think a lot of it will be done in hardware, not in software. One dedicated hardware. One is that uh, you might want another Fostel. He had an enormous impact on the whole. Yeah, but they don't come easily. <laughs> <laughs> John was, um, was a unique person uh, because one of the things, he had enormous impact and he had no self in grad. what's the word I'm after? Self gratification. He did. A, he did a wonderful job. Uh, just a side issue. John is known for his work in the ITF and standards. John's thesis was actually on protocol verification and was pioneering effort in that area, uh, which most people forget. Uh, Paul Malcapetras was Paul. Uh, yes, sir. Um, <coughs> the. Past systems that we built uh, have security problems principally because of the economics involved. We had um, memory that we wanted to share so that we could uh, uh, you know, make more use of little space, and um, we, we designed multi user systems. Uh, so that many people could use a single machine. Um, is there some merit to, uh, to rewinding that and uh, in, you know, getting rid of the you know, virtual memory and all of that? No, it, it, I never said that. I mean, machines like Multex did all of the above in a, what, A2 level security eventually. Do, they, do we need that today? Yes, I think we still need it. Um, we may choose to operate differently, but I think in general, the multi-user machines, especially if they're accessing data, large data, is necessary. Um, the, 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 economic, the economic landscape uh, for that hardware and that sem those semiconductors may change, us, change how we build those machines. No, I don't really think so. I think the, the structure of the machines will change, but um, not, not the requirements to have multi-threaded operation with shared memory. The, the thing I believe is that our shared memory will go uh, geographically shared, as opposed to what we do now, which is sort of a funny form of shared memory, but it's not really shared memory as far as the process is concerned. Now, part of it is when I look at the highest bandwidth interfaces in most computers, it's between the processor and memory. If, uh, the other belief I have, and I could be thrown out for this one, is that uh, our communication between the processor and everything else will 
be probably optical. Uh, it gets harder and harder to support anything else. Or architectural solutions for a changing uh, economic landscape. I think the economic landscape is fundamentally different today than it was when those systems were designed. I don't think it is. The things have gone cheaper. You know, if you look at, at a Multix machine now, what's the capability of that? Uh, you know, I have probably more power in my cell phone than I have in a Multix machine. I don't think that's the issue. I think, I think the justification for multi-threaded environments with different applications is still there. Shared memory is still there. I would argue that the shared memory will be much more elaborate than it is now because I need protection mechanisms. I need very high bandwidth. You want to hide latency and all of that stuff. But I, I wonder, you, we have a number of security challenges. And the security challenges, when I look at that, I just, I, I think there are ways out of that. So there's that. Well, even a mobile device has uh, many needs for compartmentalization yes. of functionality. And, and at the moment, you have access to everything. Yeah. App, one app has access to everything. Everything. Yeah. And that's, yes, sir. You, you said you wanted to start in rights management. You said you wanted to start in rights management. And Whenever somebody says that, I always wonder whose rights. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in okay. World where there was a country that had a copyright law that said seventy years. So uh, yeah, remember. <laughs> if you looked at my past, I've been a member of the board of trustees of EFF for a long time, and I think that our rights, our copyright laws are shrunken. You now they're they're very very bad. Uh, that's a political process. Okay. But, but is there a technical solution for the, for the people who live in limited copyright land to have no copyright protection on things that are over 70 years old, while in Hollywood land, things are locked down forever? How, yeah. do, you, how do you address that problem when it's just geography that affects whether I can see a bit? I think, I think you do it by law and by technical capabilities to say if I receive this object, okay, it, it must conform to the copyright laws of the country it's being played in or viewed in. That's complicated because, in fact, we're not doing things like that now. I mean, it's really time to rethink the whole goddamn copyright <laughs> thing, especially the Mickey Mouse yeah. issue. No, I've, uh, EFF has fought for years on that one. one. One more thing that adds on top of this is that the hardware itself is uh, uh, something which can be hacked. The network, the network structures, the uh, uh, mechanisms for interconnectivity can be hacked. The software on a particular system can be hacked at multiple levels. Uh, what do we need to do to protect the, the very large number of levels that exist in, in a network distributed computing system, which is the internet? To make sure it isn't easily hacked. <laughs> but right now, the architecture of most of the machines we deal with makes it almost trivial to hack almost anything. You can hack at software level. The processor does provide the proper framework to prevent that from happening. There's no way of really compartmentalizing that isn't bypassable. So it's, it's, almost, um, it's almost trivial to hack. And what about, does that say to the Internet of Things? Uh, <laughs> so short. No, I'm serious. I think the Internet of Things, if it continues the way it is now, is going to be a major catastrophe. Uh, the Internet of Targets. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but if this goes, if we continue the way we're going to do things, we're, we're asking for some major nightmares. Yeah. Um, again, I'm, uh, what I'm trying to do here is to not get trapped in current engineering issues. And yes, we need a lot of people who are doing current engineering and trying to fix these things. It's, there's a... a unstoppable wave to do the Internet of Things, because everybody sees money in it. Right? It's going to produce a nightmare, uh, which we'll, we'll have to deal with for a while. 
uh, for a long while. But I would rather that not see that perpetuate forever. And so building something that we can be reasonably sure is bulletproof, as bulletproof as we know how to make it, and can operate at the speeds uh, that we're going to have to deal with in the future. And if you don't think you'd like terabits at some point in the game, I think you're in the same boat as people who said, ah, you'll never need a gigabit. And some, some of the virtual reality stuff are going to demand extremely high bandwidth, extremely low <coughs> latency issue things, none of which we can particularly do right now. Yes, sir. Uh, two of the traditional problems with distributed shared memory are like RPC. It's, it's trying to abstract away the latency and the error model. Do you have any thoughts on how to deal with those? I know how to deal with, well, two things. I think I know how to deal with the error. I know an attack on the error model. Okay. Um, as far as the latency is concerned, you know, one of the things we do very, very well in modern computers is to deal with latency. And you know, every computer we have from, from the PC up and back does uh, predictive caching, get the data where it's needed before it happens. And we've been doing that for how many years now? With primary, secondary, tertiary memories and caching. Uh, I think we can get a good handle on that, being able to put the, make things appear where they should be and minimize the future latency. Um, now, we're not, it's not going to be perfect, because there is latency. But we can do a lot better than we do right now. And th there are endless papers on this. So at least 50 years. At least 50 years, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, at least 50 years. I remember, everybody know George Mealy here? Yeah, you would. George wrote uh, the uh, description of a uh, I.O. system back in, what, uh, 62, that dealt with multiple levels of caching and minimizing latency and maximizing uh, throughput, et cetera. Uh, again, the, as I mentioned in the abstract, we, we have a short memory. Yes, sir? At some point, the idea of user disappeared. Uh, you know, we had users in operating systems that logged in and had credentials <coughs> and rights to operating system objects. And then databases came along and web apps came along and suddenly the user became mediated by this web app which translated that user that user's rights into a single database user which had access to all the tables to read, write, and even delete them perhaps. Um, so, you know, how did we go so wrong in that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, what I see, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm getting old, uh, is a reversion back to the centralized computing facility. And we escaped that with the PC. And the large reason that the PC was successful in the industrial is it got us away from the control of the central computing facility. The current environment has put us back in the control of that, and the user has very little prerogative. Uh, I think in the in the world where you have the isolation protection of that I'm proposing, or th that I think should be there, the user becomes important again, because uh, and, and model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yes. So suppose you get this well-designed architecture. How do you get it manufactured securely? <laughs> I'll give you one proposal, which I'm not sure would work. Okay. Um, if, in fact, the financial industry is panicked enough, okay, they have a lot of, a lot of power. Uh, some of the power industry, and well, power industry itself doesn't, but the, Fed, the governments have some Capability. Financial industry, I think, is an interesting target because they buy a huge amount of stuff. They have major nightmares going forward. Their security problems are beginning to be non-trivial. We don't know how bad, but as I think I said, I talked to one of the heads of a very, very large multinational bank, and he says the, the re thing he stays up at night worrying about is security. 
Let me phrase the question differently. Is there any theoretical basis to believe you can make a processor that's self-aware being secure? I think you can build a processor which, to the best of our understanding, can be made uh, secure in the sense of providing isolation and protection. Right, but since I don't know who manufactured it, can the processor itself be self-aware? Uh, in the sense of checking itself? I that think... That's been manufactured those specifications. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And I, by the way, I didn't say there isn't some interesting research here. Okay? I mean, this is not a trivial exercise in producing this. In fact, we may not be able to. But unless we try, we're not going to be able to. And I don't personally don't like to look in the future where we continue in, in our role in That's what we're doing now. A theoretical basis. <sighs> not, yet. not yet. I, I would make the comment that okay. your, your mobile device and your laptop have typically something on the order of two dozen devices which are processors in essence. Yes. And a lot of those have direct access to main memory. Yeah. Which they so have. We have no idea. Most of them are manufactured somewhere in another country. Right. We throw them together. There's a composition problem here that nobody's looking at. Right. So your theoretical uh, approach uh, thus far has completely ignored that problem. I'm not yes. arguing that. As I said, there are some. No, I'm just yeah. The I mean, there are some very <laughs> difficult uh, research problems which uh, manufacturers largely have ignored. And is what they're getting what they wanted to get? I don't know. Has uh, yeah. any manufacturer actually dealt with that for real? A friend of mine manufactured Commodore 64 emulators that all fit in a nice little joystick. Oh, yeah. And the people she worked with at the factories in China were always trying to redesign everything because they yeah. always try to redesign everything to shave a couple of you know millisecs off the price. Well, there is a cure for that, which. Um, I'm not sure I'd like to propose for that particular problem, uh, which we may have to do someday. You know, we're, we're, I hate to talk politics, but I will. Um, you know, you read that Japan that could say no. Okay, Japan could never say no. I mean, it didn't have the economic base to say no. China does. And we, at some point in the game, I'm not an anti-Chinese person, uh, but at some point in the game, we're going to have to understand that, that what we put in our critical f uh, devices, we may not control. And, but again, it's an interesting question. How do I know? Uh, how do I know that a chip, for instance, is doing what it was designed to do? And that's something the manufacturers have worried about Know, being able to reverse engineer their mass so they can see if, if in fact, what's there is what they asked to be there, right? Uh, I don't think, I think it's more complicated than that, but it's an interesting research problem. Yes, sir? Uh, the problem of devices uh, being able to uh, do things that they shouldn't be able to do was even being ignored back in the 80s when uh, Kiko's underwent its uh, security examination, and they said, we don't worry about the I.O. controllers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But I, I commented that we, we um, actually Dick Hamming was considerably more blunt in his comment than I laid out. Uh, and the fact that we, the academic, my friends are going to kill me for this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, I think it's time to crack down on uh, both papers and theses and require them to actually do the research of what has been done. You know, it, and they, they, if we were physicists, I'm assuming most of us were engineers, and we publish papers such as uh, published in computer science often, not completely, I, mean, I can't curse the whole field, where papers are presented which which sounds like they're describing a system which have never been built. Uh, the, the push of uh, students to publish five papers before they graduate 
just generates some pretty bad science. The fact that we don't do research on prior results and we replicate them, in most fields of science would be drummed out on, of our field. Physicists wouldn't dare do that, at least the ones I know. They wouldn't survive the uh, online journal. We do it and we survive. That's got to change. Again, we have to build on the shoulders, recognizing that they did things wrong. I'm not saying that you can just adopt what's in the past. But unless you have a knowledge of that past, you're going to repeat the same errors, most likely. Yes, sir? In CS244, one of the things they do is try to reproduce published networking experiments and see if the results hold, which is always interesting. If it's never considered publishable, right, because it's, it's not a new result, it's just reproducing an existing result to verify it. Well, yeah, um, I can tell you a long story about uh, things have gotten better, but the fact that a number of papers are, theory is justified by simulations. Now, I, I, this is historic, so I was brought up, uh, when I first arrived at Bell Labs, I worked for a guy named Mill Terry, who had a very simple algorithm. He said, never believe a simulation unless you can calibrate it against the working system, because you have no idea in the world of, what, of how accurate it is. If you have a working system, you can calibrate it. If you do calibrate it, you can make small changes and still have some assurance it's probably still valid. But people go and make, now remember the Ethernet papers, the endless number of papers which ran simulations on some minor change in the Ethernet and showed a 1% improvement in a simulation that had to have a 15, 20% variance. And that's statistical <laughs> nonsense. And yet they were accepted and published and then work based on that. That's, you know, we don't teach statistics in most. Computer science. Okay, let me suggest uh, there's a, <coughs> the podcast that came out yesterday with Doug Mon, uh, former NSA, former DARPA, and now at uh, Homeland Security head of uh, HR. Um, he made the comment that we spend typically 80% of our effort on so called R&D, and that's questionable. Yeah. And uh, maybe 20% on tech transfer. What we really need is 80% on tech transfer, and, and uh, now remember, he's in applied research and applied development. But uh, would, you, would you care to come in on that? I certainly think we need more time on tech transfer. Um, now, we do a, a modest amount of that in universities. We transfer our technology to students who hopefully go out and deploy it. Uh, the thing that worries me the most in our current R&D world is if you look at Almost every company that says they spend X dollars for R&D, most of it is for D. And that is a real catastrophe. A place up in Redmond, okay, I asked once, you know, at that point I think they were spending 40 million on R&D, and the R was under 5 million. No. You certainly remember the story of the IBM $40 million in 1970, whatever it was, where they finally decided they needed religion on security. And the rumor was that it was, uh, what is it, 39, 39 million on uh, PR and 1 million on travel. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, IBM did a fairly nice design on FS. Uh, we had series ones, and once you piled the, shaved the crap out, the underlying structure was a very good vehicle for a fairly high security environment. But they never, they never showed it to the world. Yes, sir. You've been in both the telco world and the internet world. The telco world is big on billing and metering. Uses a substantial portion of bandwidth and. Uh, code to do that. In the internet world, that's anathema. Which is right? Uh, the internet world. <laughs> but how do you prevent the tragedy of the commons? Uh, like where you have no billing, no metering, and all you have is advertising. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you said, well, let me back up for a minute, okay? It depends on what you're metering. I think it is not irrational 
to put high watermarks, um, not quotas, high watermarks so you can detect uh, things which overload your system. But I think you have to prove that it overloads your system. Now, uh, 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 Jason Livingood almost got drummed out of, of um, Verizon, of, of Comcast, when he said that quotas were not an engineering problem, they were a marketing problem. And I think that's the issue that you have to separate. If you have somebody who's consuming a, a significant percentage of your bandwidth to the detriment of others, I think you have to do something. There's just no way, this is with my political hat on, okay? There is no way you're going to meet a demand of somebody who says, I have an application which needs a gigabit to my home in rural America. I mean, it's not going to happen uh, without a major investment, and unless there w somebody's willing to pay for that investment, uh, it's not going to happen, period. So there's, there's balance there, but if, you're, if you take the position of we're going to build for every goddamn bit that goes across, you're going to kill, kill the golden goose. And certainly the, the relatively unrestricted bandwidth that we have now has, has generated a huge amount of business. The problem is it's taking away from one set of companies and giving it to the other. Uh, that's the FCC's mandate to take care of that. Uh, I, you know, I've spent a year at the FCC. I've written a lot of papers on it. Um, the FCC has become political. <laughs> and I think that's an error. <laughs> Well, it wasn't, it wasn't political when I was there. You know, uh, Chairman Kennard basically said that, you know, he, for instance, I was invited to the White House once for security thing, and he said, you can't go. I said, why can't I go? Well, because the FCC is an independent agency, and uh, you know, we have mechanisms that if they want you, they have to go through this, and we don't. Uh, um, the current chairman said, yes, sir. I think... There's a, a basic problem there in what, what they do and how they control. And I'm really worried about the fact that they are going to kill the golden goose before we're done. Um, yeah. Any remote questions? Is anybody remote? <laughs> There's one there. I can't see it, so. Is somebody on? Why don't, can I just ask them? Yeah, turn the robot around so I can talk to him. Oh, I'll, I'll stand up. Yes. Hello, hello, hello. Is this working? Is this on? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. You hear? All right, this is Sheldor, the Hecklebot. Ah, uh, yes. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned several places where computer science as a science ran an experiment, and you were surprised by the results. Um, in, in sciences like physics, we may have a range of values coming back, but we're seldom surprised that something floats away on its own. Nick Tredenik has a theory that any discipline that has to call itself science, like computer science or, phys or uh, social sciences or political science, must not be a science because people in physics don't need feel a compulsion to identify themselves as it. When will we get to the point where this might actually be a formal science, and what will we call ourselves then? Uh, I think. Yeah, I, I'm throwing, actually my, my main uh, kick there is economic science. Uh, <laughs> I've written a number of papers with an economist, a very good one, and he says, according to economic theory, and I ask him, what are the postulates of this theory you have? Uh, I don't get an answer, so I walk away. Um, Software engineering. Yeah, well, that's a big problem. Uh, yeah. our, our progress in software engineering uh, has been glacially slow. It's a very difficult problem, uh, especially in the environment where now where they're big uh, sort of monsters, and we really don't understand how to, how to engineer. I was out talking with uh, um, good old yes, thank you. Um, I should kick myself in the rear end. CMU woman, Mary. And, uh, sorry, 
I spent a half a day with her. And uh, yeah, we're making some minor progress, but it's relatively minor. And part of the problem, I think, is that software, and I could get into a real interesting argument here, the thing closer to software is, is an author, authoring a complex book. And, you know, it's not a science yet. But putting it together, how to structure it, we, we have to get a handle on that. And it's probably not going to be a formal proof of the correctness of, a, of something. Well, finally, uh, computer science isn't a science at all. It's an engineering practice. And, uh, it's not that either. It's not that either. No. Not even that. But, <laughs> but you know, is, is there any reason to believe that computer science should be like other sciences? None. I mean, we, we've casted a model. I think it could create its own environment, but it has to be, it has to be, uh, has to have the attitude of a science. Namely, that when you make statements, they should be based on evidence, not hope. Yeah. I mean, it, this has been going on since the beginning. When, I, when we did DCS, I kept reading these papers that people have written with uh, uh, distributed systems that they were reporting on. And you read this long paper, and at the end was the comment that, well, sometime we might think of actually trying it. That's, and throughout the whole paper, there was never a hint that this was just a, an idea. Right? That's not science. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? This is Sheldor, the Hecklebot again. Uh, early, you mentioned the 432 being a noble experiment. There are a lot of individual technologies that derive from that. The existing floating point standards, the caching mechanisms, the way many of the high performance Pentium chips worked, the transaction bus protocol. Uh, a lot of the microcoding techniques, a lot of that evolved from the, el the various elements of the 432 project. It was just as a whole that it didn't quite work, but it did, it still lives on to this day in many other forms. Yeah, and it was an experiment. <laughs> and experiments yield uh, things that are uh, extensible, but as a, as a commercial product, you know, the comment was that, that it was not a successful commercial product for a whole host of reasons. But yes, the technology that came out of it was very extensible. The same as, I don't know if anybody remembers, IBM's uh, experiment in building a telephone system. Remember that? <laughs> out of that came a whole host of very, very good ideas. Hello, Dr. Dr. Farber, this is Hecklebot again. Um, one last comment, the enterprise with Siemens um, that didn't work out quite right had the acronym BIIN, which was picked at random, but afterwards they said it stood for billions invested in nothing. <laughs> well, the story I hear, and I have no way of authenticating this, okay, is that, um, at least no, no way I'm going to claim, is <laughs> that in fact they had an order for a bunch of machines, a bunch of the Gemini machines, not as a switching system but for a certain agency in Washington. Uh, the company was owned 50% by Siemens, 50% by Intel. Uh, the customer could not buy from a non-US controlled entity. <laughs> Siemens they proposed to sell us 1%, we promised we'll never vote it. And Siemens said that would not be proper. And so the order vanished and with the product. You talked about this uh, sort of restart idea and doing it in the financial sector. Do you have a practical thought of how it might be? Yeah. Would this be privately yeah. funded? Yes. I think it will be funded by a combination of industry supplying what they can supply, uh, the NSF, the government, including DARPA potentially, funding in joint um, to do it. NSF itself is incapable in a funny way of funding because they give grants. And grants have the annoying habit of, you know, there's no way to hold the investigator's feet to the fire. Uh, that's why in the, in the gigabit test beds, we, we had a joint funding thing. So there was a way of, of holding, you know, you said you were going to do it, do it, damn it. Uh, I'm not, I don't think we're talking about a lot of money to begin with. 
And initially, it's a design issue. And it may be a very difficult, very long design with some experiments. But you know, it, uh, the payoff could be enormous if it happens. And the downfall of not doing it could be enormously expensive. So you take your choice. Oh, yes, sir. Well, that brings up the commercial side of it. I do CPUs, and so I can address that portion of the overall security environment, the or the portions I cannot address. But as a practical matter, as a CPU designer, um, a grant or even a small dedicated system doesn't do anything. One has to be into the mass market. And I am perfectly capable of designing a secure CPU. The problem is I can't sell one. <laughs> if, if I could convince a major uh, part of the economy to demand it, could you sell them? Um, in the mass market? No. No, you're not going to sell the mass market. Uh, but then there's no economics, because the economics of scale but you know, drive your cost to the, to, so it becomes impossible. At that point, you're a captured source for uh, uh, the government research project, but that's not very useful. Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, there are, have been companies which have basically taken a reasonably interesting attack on the security aspect and created two products. Okay, one stripped down basically for the mass market where you just don't enable the good stuff. And the other where you do enable the good stuff for the high cost marketplace. And I think that's the path you take. Now that was, that's the fundamental idea that I thought it was in back of things like Lagrange, that you're not going to be able to sell to, you're not going to be able to sell that for added value to the consumer, but in fact you can add the value to the specialized market and, we, and make the whole thing profitable. But that, you know, that's an interesting, uh, What I, was, what I was about to say is that if we don't do it, we may not have a market. Yeah. Unlike <laughs> architecture with capabilities to take merely one possible approach, um, and a microarchitecture without capabilities are not a downgrade. Those are two different machines. Oh, well, yeah, but if you're going to build one, depending on how you market it, you can still attack the base, the mass market. What's the, what's the cost difference if somebody is paying for the design for the secure environment and you're you're basically uh, crippling it you know, in a funny way for the mass market. I was on the Intel Itanium team, mm -hmm. and there was a bit in the architecture that we wanted architecturally exposed, the floating point sticky bit. And because of the cost of doing just that, it's not exposed. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't sell to commercial com customers because they won't accept the environment we're in now, what do you do? <clears throat> I mean, you, Intel with the SGX is facing that same issue. Uh, they think there's a marketplace. I think there is too. I think Dennis is trying to shut, shut down, down the remote. Just a couple things. We're about to lose the remote. Oh, okay. Uh, one, uh, short term social problems best solved by contributing to EFF. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mid range. To the long term problem, we're all going to be employed. There's a big, big need for, for research here and development, but research with a big capital R. Yeah. Question is, how do we get people to put money into this? Well, I'm going to try. And I think, I think the financial model you're using actually might work. Yeah. And so they have, they have the power. Uh, practically, they have the power and the access. And the. Um, Turns out uh, there are a couple of governors, uh, presidents of the regional Fed who know what's going on in the world. And they can exert one hell of a lot of power. That's right. But so can, so can the collection of hackers sit out there uh, trying to uh, siphon off uh, information and money. Well, yeah, but if we don't do something about it, they'll win. Great. Thank you very much. And, uh,